but we can you hear us can you see us can you hear us we just can't hear you <laughs> Hello? no how's it bud can you hear how's us it on it? yeah hear us? we're all cool now okay yeah. sweet oh uh, epic happy man days. yes yeah happy days good stuff guys good thank to you. See you sorry about uh these little technical things but we, we literally have them every podcast it doesn't matter who the person is i swear we we even speak to like thanks a lot melanie speak to you later thanks Mel. what's your name craig craig and gareth so i'm gareth craig and gareth yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, but we just, like we said, we're super excited. You were a big influence in our life uh, growing up in South Africa. You know, we listened to your music growing up. So, it's, it's really cool for us to speak with you. And <laughs> all right. All right. So, you're recording there on your phone for sure. <laughs> Like, uh, let's do it. All right. Like, uh, you ready, buddy? <laughs> I'm ready, bud. Okay, one, two. All right. So we're here with uh, Honor Carstens. How's it, Honor? Thanks so much for coming on our show. Woohoo! <laughs> How are you guys doing? Are you well? Yes, but Epic. we're super well, man. We're so excited to speak to you. Seriously, it's been ama- it's amazing that we set this up. Catalings of Africa. Yes. Exactly. I see. <laughs> That's so, so are. true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> so, Honor, you know, we were actually put in contact by my sister. Um, she had met you uh, with, along with my brother-in-law at his party. You had a gig there, and I heard it was an absolutely epic performance, epic night. And uh, so, as in rock star style, uh, they had a great night with you. So, it's really cool, actually. Yes, cool, man. That's great. Um, we've got a lot of evenings like that that happens with people. Uh, I don't always remember all of them. <laughs> of been, uh, uh, many, many a years. So, but um, as long as they have fun, I'm sure I have fun. <laughs> massively, oh, yeah, massively. <laughs> so part of our chats, Arno, is, you know, we really like to, to go back and hear about the young Arno Carsons uh, before the fame and, the, you know, the rock star label and all of that. So take us a little bit back to your youth and I would love to hear about, uh, you know, you, you were youngest of four brothers and what did you guys get up to day to day? Um, yes, I was the youngest of four brothers. Um, obviously with four brothers, my mom was a housewife. My dad was, was sort of a managing director or car salesman for Toyota. And years before that, it was uh, Citroen and stuff, but because of a part that they, pulled them out of the country. Um, and we grew up in Worcester, small town in the, in the middle of the Karoo, or just outside Paul, so the beginning of the Karoo. And, mm. um, well, a small town surrounded by mountains, and that is your only way out. Is escapism is looking at the mountains and uh, listening to music. So that is how we grew up. And uh, you were apparently more arty and your brothers were more sporty. Like, how did that sort of dynamic play out for you? And, and was it hard for you at all, being the arty one? Um, no. You know, the thing is, my dad was, uh, was really good at rugby. I mean, he, he, uh, he played for Bulland rugby. So, my brothers were, were good in sport. But obviously, my dad overshadowed everybody uh, in the family. So for me, not being such a sporty guy wasn't a big stretch. It wasn't a big thing. They were just worried that I'm not um, like I wasn't good at tennis, but I loved the game, so I played it on my own. Um, and then um, same with running. Um, I loved long distance running, but I, I, it wasn't really my thing in school. You know what I mean? But I did it on my own. So I've been actually quite sporty my whole life, but not in school. Okay. So, um, and that, um, like I said, my parents were just worried that, um, that I wasn't doing anything a little bit, you know. So <laughs> they pushed me into the, I quite liked painting. So uh, they let me go into that direction. And then eventually my mom said, look, your sporting career is taking a nosedive. So maybe you should try and play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I was doing choir my whole life, so I sang choir, um, you know, for the town and stuff. So I thought, okay, well, give guitar, and, and I love music, so I gave guitar a chance, 
And um, that was sort of my saving grace uh, was guitar. And then eventually I did theater work. You know, it's a small town and for anything to have fun and, and the, the sense of community that you get out of doing art uh, in all its forms is wonderful. You know, it's getting mm -hmm. together with your friends and normally you're all smokers. <laughs> you know, Teenage smokers and rebellion, <laughs> and uh, no, it was quite fun, you know. For sure, and, and uh, on the fringes and the black sheets. <laughs> <laughs> nice, the That's arty cool. stuff. <laughs> and talking, talking about art, you got some cool arts on your wall behind you. Is that stuff that you? I, uh, yes, that is some of the stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, I've got loads of stuff. My whole house—it's actually an art gallery. <laughs> cool. <laughs> A couple of years ago, me and my wife went to the Venice um, to, yeah, we visited Venice, and there was the Peggy Guggenheimer uh, art gallery. Uh, but it was actually an old, our old house, and mm -hmm. in a, in a house was it was full of paintings of our old lovers like uh, uh, Jackson Pollock and all these guys, mm -hmm. and it was such a vibe. It actually felt like you were you were you know you could feel the energy in the house, wow. and so. My wife gave us the idea, or gave me the idea that um, we should do the house. In a, we should do the house, which should turn the house into the gallery vibe. So in, Love it. instead of going to a gallery, hang your work in a gallery, do it in your house because then you get all the money. Otherwise, you get 40% away from, the, from your sales. Um, so she didn't really ask me. She, she, she just did it. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a brilliant move, uh, and it's worked and wonderful. It's quite a, it's quite a vibe. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. it makes a lot of sense yeah. because I mean, oftentimes you have all this beautiful art that's created. Uh, yeah, it was a signal yeah. a bit delayed there. Yeah, it's quite. Uh, delayed. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I guess it's kind of. I mean, makes a lot of sense to actually, you know, have some art around you that you've created because. You know, you actually get to look at it, and enjoy it, rather than just have it stashed away somewhere else. And uh, uh, you know, so it actually yeah, makes I, a lot of sense. Some of some of it's great, and 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 most of them just haunt you wherever you go because <laughs> they, they always feel like they're not finished. So, ah. and you're always going, ah, oh, what can I do to fix that? Uh, <laughs> and then I think you you're stuck with your own uh, capabilities, which is not always the best. And um, sort of irritates you all the time, but uh, most of the time, that's why I try and make things bright and colourful, with an interesting uh, backstory. Because that way, um, it keeps me entertained, even if I'm nice. feeling that it's not totally done. I think it was um, was it Cezanne or someone that that used to have like ten or twelve or fifteen iterations of his work, and uh, he was never fully satisfied with with something and. It sounds like, I guess, as an artist, that can definitely be the case sometimes. Yes, you know, I mean, even with music, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, if, uh, if, if I could, I would go back and destroy a lot of the songs that was on albums, that's on albums now. <laughs> but I thought like which back one? then, <laughs> awesome. And now I kind of... Uh, I now I realize it wasn't a great idea to put um, some of the songs on the album. There's always a couple of bad apples that you believe in. And then six months later you go, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> that happens. Mm. Yeah. So, that happens. Here I go. No, you go, bud. Yeah, so so um, did your were your parents? I mean, were they arty at all? Did you have some influence from your mum or dad? Um, yeah, well, definitely my mum. I think it's always the mothers, mostly the mothers. Um, she was quite into any form of painting or decoupage or whatever. Um, and um, I think you know, uh, I think definitely from my mum's side and. She encouraged me to to follow my artistic side, so I think I was influenced by my mom. Yeah. Nice. No. And you said your mom gave you the guitar to to play like one day. Uh, was music a big thing in the house? And and also, who like which musicians and and what other things influenced uh, you know your 
musical tastes as a youngster? Okay, so look, um, the the thing is, my musical taste and and the influence of that came from having really crap radio where I lived. We couldn't pick up Radio Five, <laughs> and the radio stations was just awful. It was it's like today's radio actually. Guy FM, um, what were you listening to? <laughs> I don't even listen to it. It was just, <laughs> it was a it was a conglomeration of sadness um, <laughs> back then. And what happened was um, my my brothers um, because I was the youngest. All of, I saw all of them going through their teenage years, and then um, so I would be influenced by the music they were listening to when they were teenagers. So there was three of them. So I went through the. Uh, the Pink Floyd, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and then the Bob Marley phase, and then the Return of the Doors, and then uh, the, the the New Wave era from the eighties with the Pesh Mode and Tears for Fears and Duran Duran, and so I had a massive, beautiful scope of of, of music, um, uh, mostly everything English, except I think at the end of the eighties. The full Bewegung, the anti-apartheid Afrikaans movement, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was really interesting stuff and some colorful characters like Kurs Kumbais, Johannes Karkoro. So that was my um, experience of Afrikaans music. Um, and then, and that was also my experience of English music. And then obviously by the, by the age of 16, you start building your own, well, from a much younger age, you know what you like and what you don't like. But at the age of, from the age of 16, you start to, uh, developing your own kind of, uh, you, your own generation starts taking, comes to the foreground mm-hmm. and you guys as friends start going, that's cool, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not your brother's music anymore that you listen to. <laughs> so, and of course then, I mean, I had these two buddies and because we couldn't pick up any good radio and, and where I lived, um, we started importing music from the UK. And we got these, import these magazines of um, NMH or, uh, or NMD. Uh, anyway, we got these m- magazines, they're called zines or something. <laughs> and it would be full of new breaking artists. Like there was always stories of Duran Duran and then uh, Kaya and Kaya Gugu broke up and started <laughs> Hi, uh, Duran Duran broke up and started Arcadia. You know, it's the politics of dancing. It was so <laughs> exciting. And it was, you know, back then, the, the, the pop stars and the rock stars were really, each and every one of them had a different uh, image and a different sound. And it was very optical and exciting. And it, it created a world out there that you can absolutely submerge yourself into and um, just uh, it was a when you get into it the Smiths um, oh, nice. the, the I mean just such interesting music and such cool vibes you know and like the Smiths were a total different vibe on its own and the the and and then of course uh, as we grew up then Pixies came out Cocktail Twins um, Pull jam, and the, then the whole grunge thing started happening, and that is when I left school, um, and the, and then eventually, um, 1991, 1992, 1993, I think the band started or something, and 1994 it really took off. 1993, I think we recorded our first album. Um, you, you had to have an album, <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> and then. Yep. Um, and then, and yeah, from then we, it, it took off and, um, you know, that's, that's how it went in the musical world for me. Cool. Yeah. That's such amazing influences though. Jeez. But some of the other kind of influences, I guess that's, that exist just for sort of framing it a little bit for some of our listeners that might not be aware you, you were sort of on this, you were straddling this sort of time where, uh, there was apartheid sort of segregation yeah. in South Africa and then, and then the end of that, um, it, what was, what was it like sort of in the apartheid time? And, and what was this, um, 
youth preparedness that, that people have spoken of, of youth weer, weer about hate? Or what was that time uh, and what was it like for you? Youth uh, preparedness of youth weer about That was just uh, another way to not do any real work at school. It was like a break, <laughs> an extended break period. <laughs> I didn't really know what they were trying to do with it. it <laughs> there was some hole. It was a, like I say, it was a, you know, a, a black hole in the school curriculum. Or I don't know what they wanted to prepare us for. Like, I don't know. So that was that. Um, look, uh, in those days, in the apartheid days, in the high school days, um, the fact was most bands wouldn't play in South Africa. When we were banned, all our arts, um, UK or America stuff, South Africa was banned. But also, so we always felt like we weren't part of the world back then. You know? uh, mm. We didn't really know much about what the politicians were doing. We knew we had some weird rules. But then again, Calvin, the Calvinistic religion is full of weird rules and doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and also the uh, apartheid didn't make any sense. Uh, but we were just children. We were just young people having fun. And, um, you know, this old, the old Springbok Heat Parade albums, I mean, I didn't even know that, but in those days, uh, you know, the Springbok Heat Parade albums were like the now 22 or whatever. It was full of the hits yeah. <laughs> of the moment. But we were, the artists banned us, banned South Africa from using their original copies on these albums. So we had local bands redoing that music. No ways. But they did it so well that none of us knew. Wow. What? Um, yeah, it was crazy. So the Springbok Hit Parade albums was just full of actually cover versions of what? American and British music. But it was, uh, it was done so well that you couldn't tell the difference. In fact, <laughs> years later, I had to do a cover of Bally Who's song Man on the Moon for a movie. Uh -huh. And they were the, they were the, there was these um, background vocals in the song that we had to uh, reproduce. And the um, thing is, none of us could do that. <laughs> so I phoned Ati van Veik, who was in the band, and I said, how did you guys do this? <laughs> this <is incredible." laughs> and he said, well, the guy, there was one guy who could do it in the 70s, and he's still alive, and he gave me his number, and we had to get him in to come do it. There was a no special ways. way of singing to do those backing vocals, yeah. Yes. So... Um, Thanks to uh, the boycotting the country, uh, we developed some skills <laughs> by copying other people's work. But um, like I said, that is the generation before me and I didn't really know much about that. Um, uh, so the, the cool thing, you know, in the 80s, we had Patricia Val, we had No Friends of Harry, we had great bands. Um, VR Africa, which I absolutely loved, uh, Evoid, you know, there was an English vibe and there was a, there yeah. was a movement, you know, we were kind of, uh, we were, uh, you know, quite hip or whatever. Um, but the thing is, and then the fourth revolution came and there was a political thing in Afrikaans. Um, and then, but what both of these periods and these uh, groups of people what they re represented was or we were they were in a period of we were we were banned from the rest of the world so in 1993 when Mandela came out in the nude call suddenly there was a massive hype around us uh, and it uh, actually had to do with the mandela magic uh, because um, i mean he came out uh, suddenly the whole world was celebrating the fact that we weren't killing each other and it was a big vibe all around Stellenbosch. And I was in Stellenbosch, we were all students. And um, the band was cooking every show. Because of the name Springbok Nude Girls, of course, every gig was sold out. And it was just <laughs> a drunken mayhem um, and a lot of energy. And it was an incredible vibe. And uh, the reason why, for instance, I think me and the band, 
did English music then was because we grew up with the English music. Well, I grew up with English music through, through my brothers and stuff. And yes, I liked Fulfe um, Bewegen, but I mean, they, they just did their thing and there was nowhere to go. You know, every movement reached the, 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 the ceiling and then it's time for a new generation to start, to do their own thing. So we, um, coming out of apartheid and stuff and uh, having this whole vibe, I think for us, there was a feeling that we were part of the world for the first time. Mm. And so we wanted to make music, like the music that we like, Pixies, but Nirvana, Full Jam or whatever, and, and take it to the world and say, well, yes, South Africa as well. We also kind of, we're there. <laughs> so we, we do exist. Um, and so there was just an amazing uh, vibe. Uh, that's, and that is why um, most of the bands in the 90s did English stuff. You know, yes. most of the bands at their festivals, everybody was doing English because we wanted to celebrate that we're part of the world. Of course, after after the new girls and after our generation of the X generation, the new generation came in, and I think that was quite. Um, I think the the guys who made a big mark there is a uh, Poco Policicar, mm. uh, and yeah. the more punk rock Afrikaans yeah. that was different than full Frebeweerken. Full mm. of like I say, was a political movement where um, Foko Polisikar and bands like that was more of a, a, a bit more aggressive punk rock vibe in Afrikaans, which um, still till today, they've now gained such cult status amongst the Afrikaners. Yeah. They, are, they are so massive. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> and also, I think they're making inroads into the... Um, into Nederland and Holland. Uh, so <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. But if you think about it, it's only what f a couple of million people who speaks the language in the whole world. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. So yeah. I think the birds of a feather flock together, and all of these Afrikaners really stick together. And that's why I mean, in South Africa, I think gospel music and Afrikaans music are the biggest sellers when it comes to yeah. physical product. So. Yeah, that's very cool. That's um, super interesting, hey? Really that's really cool. interesting. Yeah. Crazy. So, yeah, definitely. So, so Arno, you, you spoke about, you know, you guys sort of forming and stuff in 93. Uh, and that was um, quite a cool story, actually. Like, you, you started from what we know, like an, at an open mic night um, in Stellenbosch. Mm. So maybe you can take us back to, to that gig and, you know, how everything just began for you. Well, um, there was these open mic nights at uh, Upstairs in Stellenbosch, the place we called. Um, I was, my girlfriend's name was Delian at that stage. And she had a friend called Cornelia and her boyfriend's name was Theo. And they introduced uh, me and us together, me and Theo, they introduced us to each other. There was this open mic thing. We went in and... Um, and we jammed. I mean, that's what we did. I mean, I don't know what we were doing. We were just screaming and playing loud guitars and things. And it was a very cool. He was amazing. And I think we really hit it off. And then uh, the guy said, well, you guys, it'd be cool if you guys start a band and do a show. The owner of the place. So I said, okay, well, cool. Give us two weeks. And in the two weeks, we had to like, or three weeks, or whatever, we had to get the full band together. So we got... We went to another gig called Moaning Lisa um, <laughs> a few days later. There was this band called Moaning Lisa. And the, ba the bassist and the drummer, I thought they, I liked the way how the, the sounds, I loved the way they were playing. It reminded me of the band House of Love. So um, I met them, Francia and Arno, and I said, well, let's come join me and Theo and let's do a gig together. We'll write some stuff and do it. Um, and you know, I, I can't even remember, but I think we had eight songs or nine songs in the beginning. But it was, remember, uh, for a musician, when you start, you've been writing those stuff for 20 years. Mm. So they come so quickly. Yeah. So we, we, we were just literally shitting out the songs as far as we can. And, um, <laughs> and um, then we needed a name for the band. So... Um, Look, the, the thing is, my girlfriend back then, she woke me up the next morning. I think I was still a bit tipsy. And I was lying <laughs> in bed. And she normally puts the radio on while she's getting ready for work. 
and I sort of dozed off and I could hear the DJ saying, and tomorrow night the Springbok noodles will be appearing live. <laughs> at the, and I thought, oh, cool. And I quickly woke up and quickly wrote it down. And then that evening I met up with a, with a band and I said, well, I've got a cool name for the band. It must be Springbok noodles. And then I went to take French. I said, but one problem, there's no girls in the band. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, exactly, exactly. That's why. Super awesome. <laughs> you know how many people are going to come watch us? Uh, yeah. Nude girls? I mean, uh, and it worked like a bomb. It was a charm. It was an instant uh, cultural kind of phenomena, the name. Because obviously it brought back to the older generation the thing of the Springbok Hit Parade albums. Yeah. Of the, na- the, 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 co- the cover girls, there was always cover girls sitting on a bonnet of a car, naked, <laughs> semi naked, stars in the nipples. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and then it was just um, also the, the fact part of our success with the thing that we also actually sounded quite unique. Um, as much as I want to sound like Nick Cave and a lot of people, <laughs> you can't sound like other people, you can only sound like yourself. And then also because Theo was a Pantera, quite more metal guy, and I was a bit more Pixies and mm-hmm. more alternative. Blue Man, Francia sort of shared also more of alternative vibe. And then eventually Adrian, when he joined us, he was into um, acid jazz and more clubby stuff. Yeah. So the conglomeration of all these um, different tastes in music. Um, created a very unique sound um, for a grunge band to kind of have trumpet in was quite weird. Um, and, you know, the fact that I, my voice sounded unique and I used a lot of delays. And so we created a, a massive sound uh, and our songs were very eclectic. And we, we did from reggae, we went from, in some songs we went from reggae to punk to jazz and then back to punk. And so, I think it was really interesting um, for the people back then. And there was just such a vibe. The 90s was, the 90s there was, there was a stage where it was all about experimenting and being different. And like I think every generation probably, except now it's not very, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't hear a lot of interesting things. It's all kind of the same. But also, I mean, you guys had come out of that real suppressed sort of a state in, as, a, as a nation. And then everyone was like, Check at me, look at my, cre- this is my creativity, yeah, dress myself, true. you know. So, yeah, we came out of an area of um, under the pillow, smothered under the pillow. Mm-hmm. And then when we got out, that's probably why we did jazz, reggae and disco all in one song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were just creative. In the meantime, <laughs> we were just desperate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely an eclectic mix of things. That's for sure. So, Arno, I just wanted to find out, like, did did you guys socialize much with other bands at the time? Like, was it this cool mix or were you in competition, like, say, with just Ginger and, and all the other guys that you kind of just mentioned earlier? Um, it's it's a mixture. I mean, you, you I would meet people and I would just go, wow, well, that's not really my type of person. And then you just, you, you, you're friendly, but you're not, you know. Yeah. And then there's another one where you, 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 it's a nice person. The music, but the, the band, the music is not your cup of tea. And again, mm. then you're just nice, but, you know, you say, oh, I heard your new song. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, then there's another group that uh, you just absolutely love their music and they're cool guys. And you guys kind of stick together. Well, we, I fell in love and I think me and Theo, our two bands fell in love. It was uh, Spring of Nucles and Butter and Nierge. And ah. of course, they were industrial and electronic yes. and heavy. And we were heavy, but, you know, normal, no, no electronic <laughs> sound. But, yeah. you know, not that much electronic. So it was very good for us to play together because the two bands together brought a, a very entertaining show, you know, of different sounds. Um, so we toured, we toured together. We did a lot of shows together. Batra Nierke and Springbok Nikos. Nice. There was this thing in the media that there was this competition between Sugar Drive and the Nude Girls. But 
Ah, sugar dry. That was just made up by, I think, um, I think it was a clever hoax that they tried to pull from the sugar dry fans to create this thing <laughs> that there is a competition. <laughs> For me, there was never a competition. The fact is, we did what we did, and they did what they did. And um, I think both of us were fairly um, successful on radio. Therefore, people will think there's a bit of a competition, but there wasn't really. And um, Paul Flynn, the lead singer from Sugar Drive, is one of the most funniest guys I've ever seen. And so <laughs> we used to hang out a lot. And uh, we partied a lot, man. So, yeah, Paul... <laughs> From Sugar Drive, and then um, Hazel Berger, Adnel, and the guys from from Batra Nierge. and then also Nine was really cool from Cape Town, that band. Um, but yes, I mean that is how that was basically our social scene back then. And it was a large social with, scene. With lo <laughs> yeah, with lo with loads of. Um, Radio DJs always in the backstages and also um, music um, journalists. Mm. There was loads of, we had lots of music journalists back then. And yeah. um, they used to wax so lyrically about the shows. It was wonderful. <laughs> I think they tried to outdo each other with using <laughs> great, great English shows, you know. <laughs> Talking about that, uh, talking about collaboration, actually, you, you, you'd um, and, and friendships. You'd actually, when you were younger, you saw Johnny Clegg perform, and uh, and and he'd actually ended up collaborating with you. Like, it's quite a special thing, isn't it? Um, I think. Uh, well, I yeah, I was sixteen, um, and you saw the Savuka. So Johnny Clegg and, Sav and Savuka, yeah, Savuka. They played in Booster in the town hall. And so all the school, you know, for us who wanted to go, all the school kids, we went. And the, the town hall was sort of divided. The white kids and the Dumini the priests, we were dancing on one side. And then all the black people were dancing on the other side. It was a really awkward wow. vibe. And I remember wow. saying to the, 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 the Dumini, man, these people... The, 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 you know, let's dance. If we're just dancing together, let's just, and he said, fine, cool. And eventually we were wow. all were just dancing together and something. But that was just another interesting thing about, uh, you know, those days, uh, you know, it was weird. We, uh, you know, end of the day, we've lived through an incredible time. I mean, I saw the end of apartheid. I saw the end of the cross over the Berlin wall. Um, and, um, we've seen so many, so many interesting things happening in our lifetime. Mm. Um, I mean, I was there before TV, then TV, and now there's internet. Now you can't even imagine it being no internet. Yeah, and imagine yeah. being no TV. Um, and the old telephones and now cell phones and stuff. So we've lived through an incredible time, and I think in the next... 10 or 20 years, there's going to be some wild stuff happening. Imagine yeah. having uh, um, AG and you know what I mean, 4G, <laughs> AG. And there's going to be some, and what that's going to be able to activate nanotechnology and stuff. And that's all that's going to happen in the next 20 years. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we're in for an incredible ride. Yeah. And yeah, and also musically, we've been there when. You made oh, when we used to make a lot of money in the music industry, yeah. you know, when there was things like rock stars, uh, rich rock stars, and stuff like that, to a thing where now you don't make any money in, in it anymore, except from yeah. playing live, and yeah. where you can basically might as well just give your album away for free, which you're actually doing. The album has wow. become a flyer now, where it used to be a real piece of art and something. Wow, so um. It, yeah, we're living in an incredible, uh, in an incredible time, and we have lived in incredible times. We uh, sometimes, you're looking back and remembering things, you almost don't want to say what happened, but because today is such a PC environment, but mm. you know, the history is the history, and it is what it is, and we got to deal yeah. with it. Yeah, for sure. So right, and and 
you spoke a bit about like technology and stuff there and, and you were actually maybe not into technology as a youngster, but you wanted to become a scientist as well, didn't you? What, yes. what was the influence around that? <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, it was always the scientists that got bit by spiders or fell into nuclear waste and became superheroes. There we go. Well, you know, space movies, Star, Star Trek, Star Wars, it's all science. And uh, it's just, uh, yeah, you want to be part of that. I, I love sky fi and I just love, I mean, today I, 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 I love Twitter because I get to follow all my favorite science magazines and yeah. um, interesting um, uh, pseudoscience. Uh, I, I love paranormal and UFO in different dimensions and uh, lo there's lots of technology stuff that I uh, find. I mean, there's such a lot of stuff happening in yes. technology at the moment. And it, it, it's, 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 it's very exciting because it basically is sci fi, but it's just happening right in front of you. Sci fi. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but it's true. But you know, you know, you know what I think so interesting is like I never used to be into into sci-fi, right? And and now I'm like much more into it because I actually reckon a lot of the stuff that say we used to watch in the day that was sci-fi is actually coming true. You know, you're like, oh yeah, this yeah. is, what and it's like, oh maybe they're almost prepping us for what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> Yes, of course. I mean, the, the Star Trek, the phone, a cuckoo, cuck, you know, and then yeah, you, yeah. There, there, we got it. Um, they are talking about uh, warp speed and stuff like that. They are doing, you know, they are, it's incredible how a lot of the stuff they used to talk about then, they're actually working on right now. I mean, um, I'm still waiting for the flying car. Come on. No, there's one. There's one. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there's, I mean, I saw, a, I saw a TED talk recently of a guy that's actually, he literally has developed like not a flying car, but like a small micro airplane, a helicopter, sorry. And, uh, and that's like going to be used almost the same way that you use Uber. Like it's, it's incredible. <laughs> yes. I was blown See, away. I just don't trust that, you know, but <laughs> Yeah, you but, but think, about, think, think about it, right? So, so like um, <laughs> the, a, a guy gave a very good analogy the other day. He's like, like 10 years ago, you would never ever in your life ring up a stranger um, or, or communicate with a stranger on a telephone and you would definitely never get in a stranger's car. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. We're always communicating with strangers online and we get into an Uber. You don't flip and know who the Oak is, but you get into it, you know, and yeah, we just yeah, take yeah. that as a thing now, you know, like this is, that's how you we see, what I just don't trust is the fact that um, using stuff to keep you up in the air that spins mechanical things. I, you know, I know it's all safe, and, but that is, if there's a mixture, be, I, I mean, if there's a mixture between anti-gravity and... No, I hear you, but I, I totally... think it's a bit of a backup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a backup. <laughs> like a helicopter almost doesn't count in my mind. I, I hear what you're yeah. saying. It's like, I want to flip and lift off with like from a, you know, with, with almost not knowing how it's lifting off, <laughs> yeah, I mean, then I'll be satisfied. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you spoke about um, DJs and stuff, but I, I couldn't help but remember Barney Simon. Uh, you know, he, he, that's when I first heard you guys actually, he was like the Springbuck nude girls, like he, on his late, I can't remember what his show was called, Barney Simon show. Or, um, if it's too loud, you're too old. Too yes, old, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> He's coming through the door. door. <laughs> and what, was it hard to like get airtime, like to get you guys on the air and, and what have you at that stage? Or man, we were so starved. There was nothing out there, so it was really easy. I mean, I couldn't mm. believe the songs. They were they, they were some songs of ours they played. I was like, that is a really crap song. <laughs> I can't believe they're playing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just think because we, the, the Springboard Noodles, we were the first band to have a CD. It also really, um, it, it really uh, took off, you know, and mm. suddenly they had something to play and there was something to show. And so I think it was just because we were the first 
uh, of something, you know. So it, sure. it was really easy to get on radio and to get our, our stuff out there. And, and, and nice. what, what was it like to have this kind of notoriety and then also to be earning an income now from, I guess, what was your passion? Yes. Um, look, it, it was incredible. Um, I, it was walking on, I was walking on clouds, man. It was a dream come true being world famous in South Africa uh, and going around being a young guy playing for young people and just being part of the party. And it was an incredible feeling. Um, uh, a feeling that will eventually break you. <laughs> so, uh, Why so, is that? Yeah. Uh, because I mean, seven years of touring together intensely. Uh, here it is. Your first two albums you normally come out with. Like I say, you've been writing it your whole life. So that comes easy and those are normally good songs. Then after mm. that, you're in the record company machine and you, you, you're making, you have to make money and you're making money and you also got to, you've also got to write new songs. But now you've, you've um, depleted your, your whole magazine of, 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 mm. of songs that you've had and now you've got to write new stuff, but you're so busy touring because you're so successful that you um you're not coming up with the good stuff you know what i mean so the third album and the fourth album you, we could you know we, also we've been touring together for so much um that the relationships starts um, heading for the rocks uh, the amount of of alcohol abuse and drug drug abuse at shows and after shows and stuff becomes a problem Mm. Your the relationship with the band is just not what it used to be, and uh, so things start falling apart after seven years and four albums, where also the last two you can feel it is not as good as your first stuff. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then, like, you just reach the ceiling in South Africa. Um, after seven years, and you, so we thought, well, let's move to New York. Um, we had, you know, we had a deal in Germany, and we had some interests from America. And but then moving to New York, Bloomer, Arne Bloomer from the Nuclear, he had a wife and a kid. So that's yeah. going to be very expensive to take his whole bloody family to New York. Yeah. And um, ach, and I think the whole band was a bit heartful. Um, I got really sick of screaming at people. <laughs> it's a bit boring. Um, so it was. A, so then we broke up. Um, one thing for the youth out there: never break up a band. Just take a break because you'll regret it later. <laughs> um, so we broke up then, and I think five. Then I started. Then I went into my. Um, you know. Then I thought, well, I'm not going to stop. So I want to do. Uh, I. I'm going to do a solo album. Um, but then after the nuclear, the record companies disappeared, radio disappeared, and I had no financial backing or anything. So two of my friends, two of my friend, my rich friends came to me and offered me um, money to record my first solo album. And uh, that is how I recorded uh, uh, um, Another Universe mm -hmm. with, the, with some support of friends. Um, then the first single came out and no radio would play it. That yeah. was quite sh sad and shocking and scary. But then eventually Volkswagen took the song and, and used it in a Turek ad. Huh. And suddenly it blew up and then it was everywhere. Nice. And then, um, yeah, and then, geez, basically that ad saved, saved my career in a way. Wow. And then from there it just went... And then again, in my solo career, my first two uh, solo albums went gold and did platinum and did incredibly well. Um, then I was, um, John Giddings came to me from the UK and made me an offer to do an album in the UK. So I'm, we relocated to uh, London for three and a half years. 
uh, where we recorded an album and toured with many, many, many bands mm -hmm. all around the UK and just had a spectacular time. It was a big learning curve how the British do it. You know, it's much different. And, you know, South Africa was all, we had a lot of power as artists and we could do whatever we wanted. We were very creative. We could, um, in the UK, it's more of a structural thing. And um, yeah, you've got a, a you know, it's just more streamlined and more professional and you can't just do exactly what you want. You know what I mean? Mm. So mm. that was a, a learning curve and a very interesting experience. Uh, but I mm. met a lot of lovely people there, interesting people, and who I'm still friends with today. And it was a great experience um, living in the UK. But then mm. I came back and did a Atari Gala album, which um, I loved and I think is one of my best albums. But by then, radio has changed so much. I mean, they just don't play rock anymore. You know what I mean? Mm. Especially South Africa. So the album didn't, didn't do um, that well. But I'm, I'm proud of it. You see, uh, like... As these things happen, as it can, you, you come to the conclusion, the only thing you need to do is make do work and make music that you really enjoy and that you're proud of. Uh, mm -hmm. That will reflect, and the people that are into your music, uh, fans or whatever, they will pick it up, and, mm -hmm. and they will spread the word for you. And radio, forget about radio. Just do what you want to do and make sure whatever you do is super cool and that you love it and that you're proud of it. Um, then the rest um, is it's not a big thing for sure yeah. I think that's so an important true. lesson like yeah. for anybody do something that you love that makes you happy that you're passionate about and and, and that'll come out in the work you do like you said you know because if you doing something yeah. and it's contrived because you want a certain bunch of people to like you it's just not going to come over as authentic oh. and you're not going to do well Look, in, in art, you, you've got to know, and I find it in painting and in music, you always know it sucks. You've got a, <laughs> if you've got a feeling that, uh, I mean, there's about so much, so many times in the, in, the, in the 90s and stuff, we make music videos and I'll go, ooh, this is a, I've got a feeling about this. This is not good. And then it comes up and you cringe. Oh, it's my so God. terrible. <laughs> Some of these 90s videos are so, so bad. So um, I, from then I've, I've learned to, you've got to follow your gut and just make sure, if you know something is a bit shaky, try and fix it because you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really great advice. You also spoke about, you know, just um, amazing journeys that you've had through different places, but also obviously you've played at some amazing festivals. Opi Kopi, obviously uh, I've had a great party there. Glastonbury V Festival and a whole bunch of others. What was it like playing in front of big crowds like at a festival and, and which one was your sort of favorite? Um, well, I, Shepherd's Bush Empire. We did a couple there. Was, I think we did, we've done many shows at Shepherd's Bush Empire, but I mean, uh, there was one stage where things were really crazy um, where they almost asked us to uh, stop the show because we were... <laughs> They were scared that the galleries were going to collapse. No way. Because it was just, uh, the people, uh, it was just incredible. You know, the energy of the audience and stuff. Uh, Opi Kopi, there was a couple of shows that was just crazy. But I think it had to do with the fact <laughs> that we were on LSD. Uh, <laughs> Something to do with it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean... You know, it went from, we were like the first, first, one of the first people to play at Obukopi. And it went from 5,000 people to 15 to 25,000 in a couple of years. So it was such a vibe, you know. Um, yes. But like everything that goes up, it must come down. And uh, today it's not as successful as it used to be. Um, but it's, again, it's just because the world has changed, the music has changed, and the way how we uh, listen to it and what type of music um, is out there. Um, but yes, uh, guide me through the question again. No, we're just wondering, like, which was your sort of uh, favorite festival that ah, you played at? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, festival, uh, Isle of Wight. I've had many Isle of Wights. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, I, I know uh, a lot of my friends work there and like John Giddings, my friend, it's his festival. So we've had nice. many incredible uh, times and um, wonderful memories from that festival. Uh, wow. But every festival leaves a little nugget, you know. Mm. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, I mean, I flip and love festivals. I've been to V Fest a lot of times in the UK, and always find that one like that one rocks. But what yeah. what is the feeling like? Like you standing there on stage, and you've just got this sea of heads and bodies that yeah. you see, and they're singing back to you, and there's people on shoulders. It must be quite a, I don't know, just an adrenaline rush for sure. Hey, look, uh, the nude girls are. are in my in my career, um, the Nuclecles has been the, the was the conduit to that really big live thing with a lot of, of um, fans going totally bananas <laughs> and having a, a, a extreme time, and that was really amazing. But it's also lovely to be in a band like the Nuclecles. Um, you're not the main person. You know, it's a democracy and everybody's got to do that little bit to contribute to this energy that we projected towards the audience. Um, and that was wonderful. And that is, and was an incredible feeling. And I mean, it's, you know, you can't really, I can't really explain it to you. But when then when I went solo, the whole thing changes a bit because now you're like the center point of, of attraction, you know, in the band thing. And everybody's looking at me. Yeah, uh, and that becomes just a, just a irritatingly, just a little bit irritatingly um, stressful, and you don't enjoy it that much <laughs> anymore. You know, you're not part of the gang anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but you know, um, it's not a thing of um, nervousness. I find that sometimes playing in front of a very small audience is more, is even more scary than um, mm. playing in front of a big audience. Um, and like I say, with the nuclear, there's such a lot of noise, the distortion of the guitars and the noise factor is so heavy that there's not so much pressure to sing perfectly. Yeah. Where on the, the, on the solo career, my music is much more mellow. Mm. And, um, for in my solo career, I went much more for the, um, the the beauty of melody and good songwriting in a way and a, a bit more acoustically based mm -hmm. the new girls were all about energy electric guitars big noise big rock vibe um you know when the new girls broke up um, i was having a meeting um, with the manager and i said well he was asking me what am i going to do now so I said, I've got two options. Either I start the band Skull Fuckers and go on uh, with a heavy, another heavy band, or I go and I just do what I've always done and actually bring out albums of me writing songs on the acoustic, acoustic uh, vibe, you know, that way. Um, and then we looked at each other and I thought, well, seven years of screaming and heavy guitars and <laughs> I sort of, I think I need a break from that, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so I shelved skull fuckers. <laughs> and, I, would, uh, I would have digged to have heard the skull fuckers though, but anyway. yeah, it would have been more of the same screaming. <laughs> and um, so, so then, um, yeah, I did the honor Carson thing and that's sort of, you know what i've been doing uh each album has got a different um, palette it's got a different color and stuff and then i did, also did this one album on bell tower which was an uh, electronic thing so you know for me like you say we've been banned for so long coming out you want to do everything all the time so i yeah. think yeah um, my colorful career is because it's almost sleepy time you got to get it out you know <laughs> yeah. for sure yeah. But it also says a lot about you, I think, as an artist. You know, you've, you've got so many sides to you, which is, is awesome to see. You, you had your loud, loud times with the nude girls and then you're, yeah. you're, you're singing now as a solo and your voice is absolutely beautiful and it's soothing and it's calm and I love the music that, you, uh, that you're making now. 
and uh, cool. it, it's really it's really awesome to to listen to. So thank you for putting it out there. Um, yeah. But when we, like just going back, I guess, to a little bit of your time in, in the Nude Girls, the, the lyrics that you guys had weren't necessarily political, but you did sort of have a big influence within that era. Were you kind of conscious of it at the time? And, and did you, you know, push things in that direction at all? Or, or were you just flipping enjoying the moment? You know, it's such a weird thing. Sometimes I think not being political and not saying anything is being political and saying something so in mm. a weird way. Yeah. And then, I mean, we, like, it was our thing. We were entertainers. We're not supposed to be part of. And like I said, just before us was the full Verbewegung, which was a very politically driven thing. Uh, basically anti-Calvinistic Afrikaner and apartheid mm. thing. So that was the last thing we wanted to get involved with. But coming out of out of that era, and um, our one song that I thought was quite tongue in cheek and quite uh, had a, a nice sense of humor about it was on our second album. I said we should do a reggae song, and it should be like, "What would you say if I say I love you?" <laughs> you know, um, it's kind of putting putting the 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 the, the anti-white on a on a spot you know and, uh, yeah yeah <laughs> so um and it's a reggae song i'm so confused <laughs> yeah, what's going on here so that, was, so that was the most uh, uh, overtly uh, political thing we've done it was, it's more just fun actually um and then um oh i think on the last uh on a on a at the, as the band was breaking up, we had to record two songs for best of compilation. We did Dimmer, 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 Dimmer. And we did J59. And I remember, Theo, we were watching Carte Blanche and there was this whole program on uh, child soldiers and also Stefendis, who was a guy who killed the Wurt in Parliament. And um, they, you know, they, they went to his grave site and his, his gravesite was marked by uh, the number J59. Hmm. So there's no name or anything. It was just J59. And that is hmm. where they buried uh, uh, Sefendis who killed Kavut. So I kind of mixed the story with child soldiers where the little boy said, I've lost up, uh, I used up both my hands for my fallen friends. It's just hmm. such a striking line, you know, wow. it leaves cold. Hmm. So... And I mean, that is how I think the song starts. I used to have all my hands for my fallen friends. Mm. And, and then it goes into the story of J59. And the song is called, No Tears for J59. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful kind of a ballad. Um, wow. I think that was one of the last songs we recorded before the band broke up. Um, so that was... But more historically uh, and maybe so, um, socially making us just a, making a social statement or yeah. it, I don't think it was political. It was just, uh, yeah, putting it out there. It was just an interesting thing, you know, mm. and it made for a beautiful story. And, and just while we are talking about lyrics, um, your song blue eyes, which is just an absolutely uh, beautiful song. Uh, one of my favorites it captures a really sort of sad time in south africa maybe maybe you could sort of explain how you came to those sort yeah. of very deep lyrics okay so basically um i wrote the lyrics after i heard a story from a friend of mine who was a, a police psychologist this lady um in the end of apartheid um the cops all went home. Everybody kind of hated them because they were seen as the last protectors of apartheid. Mm. And they would go home and they, you, you've got your, your service pistol with you at home. Um, the whole world hates you. There's not enough money to feed the family. Why, why, why get drunk? And in that period, there was a lot of family murders amongst cops. Mm. So my friend told me about this situation. So, uh, and then she told me about this story where this guy wiped out his whole family, except his little blonde daughter was hiding in a cupboard somewhere. 
And by the time he wanted to kill her, he came to his senses. He got her out of the cupboard and he drove to the police and he gave himself over. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, and that is where the story comes from. We're going to grow you up, sir. Daddy's little blue eyes are come for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and that is what that comes from. But, you know, like songs, everybody, I mean, uh, <clears throat> that is what it's, that's what it, the song is about for me. But every, everybody's got a different yes. interpretation. You know, some people will probably sing it to their little um, child, and you know, yeah. it's a loving thing, which yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> just, just pull out the family yeah. murder story. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a beautiful just, song. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yes, song. I, I actually, I actually got goosebumps when you actually said that. Now, and uh, I was listening to it uh, before we started the podcast, just to kind of get in the mood. Um, wow, have you ever met that girl by any chance? No, 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 no. I think that's a, the story of many a people, you know. Yeah. I think it's not the first time it's happened and probably okay. not the last. Yeah. yeah. But no, 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 no. And I okay. know oh just, you know, moving on a little bit with your solo career, you a few months sort of after your father had passed away, you were back in Worcester um, in your old house and uh, sitting in the room where, you know, you grew up with your parents and that kind of thing and you were, uh, getting some inspiration for your sort of first Afrikaans album. What what was that experience like being in your old house? Um, oh, it's cool. You know, I go there once every two months. Um, but it was a bit of a jarring um, thing to write my first Afrikaans album on my dad's bed after he passed away. Um, <laughs> so that was just a, it was just food for thought kind of thing. Mm. Uh, it wasn't necessarily sad. It was quite weird. Uh, it's just interesting. Um, but it's, in a way you think maybe my dad would have liked to have heard my first Afrikaans album, something like that, you know, yeah. sure. you know, um, but, um, I, 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 in a way, I think mentally it just brought me closer to, um, because it was all I was trying to, it's because it's your first Afrikaans album in Afrikaans in English, we just make music because it's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, you make a cool tune, get interesting lyrics, but in Afrikaans, it, uh, it for me, it felt like it was a, um, it was a way for me to get, to get real and to reflect mm-hmm. on my life and how I grew up and stuff like that. And maybe bring out some old stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, like some some naughty stuff we did as teenagers and stuff and kind of celebrate that kind of stuff and yeah. places around South Africa and and I think uh, Afrikaans was the right um, vehicle to do something like that in um, and uh, you know it's you got to be real you can't make believe in Afrikaans uh, Somehow uh, you see right through the bullshit. <laughs> so <laughs> you can't make this. I, 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 I wanted it to be poetic and I wanted it to be kind of real. Um, so there's no question of, oh, uh, you know, what is he now doing? Yeah. yeah. So, and I think we were very successful. We won a, a Guma with it. Uh, the, we won a Guma award with the album and then also we won. Um, Best engineering Sama. Although it would have been nice to also win a Sama as well, because I thought the album was that good. But we did really, really well with it. Um, mm. I think that album is right up there with another universe and will probably sell nice. um, for, for many years to come. Now I'm busy um, with a new Afrikaans album, busy writing it, and now the pressure's on. I've got to now come up with the goods. Um, <laughs> so. But yes. it will, at least you know when it's crap. So <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. To it. <laughs> I, I always work to it. Yeah. Before you go on, Gareth, I just heard a, someone's phone. Is that phone? Is your thing still recording? On? I just want to double check. No, my thing is okay. still recording. Okay. Okay. Good. I just wanted to double check. Sorry. Sorry. Carry on, Gareth. Cool. No. So I, I always uh, think that Afrikaans is such an amazing expressive expressive language and yeah like a, a joke told in Afrikaans is flipping 20 times more funny than it is told in English and it's just, just I rem- the word do it yeah yes <laughs> I mean, you know, brilliant 
you can get away with <laughs> so mean, much, you know. I, you know, I even, I even, I, I, I just, I, I didn't think I could like Leonardo DiCaprio more until he said he do it. You know? <laughs> 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 we get the knees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you he feel did, he did it so well? Huh? Yeah, he did. I because the South African accent is a hard one. It's a hard movie, one, yeah. Actually, yeah. And, and he did well yeah. in in that movie for sure. But <laughs> do you feel more connected when you write in Afrikaans compared to English? Is there any sort of relationship there? Um, man, it's a weird thing. I don't know if I'm more connected. It feels more real. But um, it almost feels like it's two different parts of, of your brain, English and Afrikaans. Like mm -hmm. I say, the one is very, very poetic and kind of deep. Mm. And English, um, for me, is more beautiful and more, uh, but more, more emo uh, not emotionally, more in delivery, it's more expressive. Right. You know, wow, yeah. You know what I mean? That kind of <laughs> yeah. rock thing. You, you can scream and stuff. Uh, for me, I, I don't know. I, I find that easier in English. Um, but, but I know, why do you think that is? Did you think that's like, because there's a history in Afrikaans um, like maybe of, the, of poetry yeah. and... Yes, I mean, uh, for me, um, the old Afrikaans language is beautiful. Look, I think it's personal. I don't think it's for everybody the same. But sure, I mean, my yeah. dad used to read, read me um, on Sundays um, before uh, Sunday lunch. He used to read Langenhoff and, mm. and uh, stuff like that. And for me, Afrikaans was, I love the old Afrikaans, the almost Dutch Afrikaans. It's so poetic. And it's like listening to German or Italian or French. You know, it's an interesting uh, yeah. language full of... <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, and poetry, and we, like I say, yeah, and, and English is just more, geez, that's, you know, what I grew up with, my brother's music, you know, Led Zeppelin and stuff. It's just, it's more, more it represents more energy and life. Yes, yes. Um, you know what I mean? And just yes. weirdness and brilliance. Nice. Yeah. So I think it's personal. I think For everybody's sure. got their own vibe. Franz Moko, for instance, he screams like a dream in Afrikaans, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That is true, actually. <laughs> so, so um, just wanted to move on a little bit. Um, you've you obviously got lots of talents, and one of them is art. Um, may, maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about your art and uh, where your inspiration comes from, and has it always been there, or is it just sort of more of a uh, a thing that you're developing now? Well, I really loved um, fine art in school, and I wanted to go study it after. I wanted to go study fine arts and you know, my parents said, no, there's no money in it. You must go do graphic art. <laughs> so I did graphic arts and I totally, oh, oh, I think I was just too messy for it. Um, and I wasn't in the mood, not after the army. <laughs> then I just wanted to party. But the art thing, um, I think it comes from the same place as where my music comes from. Uh, I kind of, it's, 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 um, it's kind of bright. I like bright colors and vibes like that. Well, I've been going through a bright phase. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I like my, uh, the, the back stories of the, the paintings to be quite maybe dark. You know, juxtaposition, mm. color with, um, with storyline. Right. Um, and um, I think somebody said my work is expressionism. Mm. Cool. I always thought it was... Uh, Serialism, but expressionism, you can actually call it whatever you want, you know. And, and for me, I love painting and I love doing it. And um, more now than ever, because um, my wife has really uh, pushed me into it and make me work, work it. Because <laughs> I think we could see we can make a dollar out of it. And, uh, but yeah. the thing is, I, 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 I do love it. And I love fin finishing a painting. I don't like necessarily always starting a painting because, and working it because I keep going, ah, oh, that sucks, oh no. <laughs> and, but you just got to work it and work it and work it and right at the end it comes out and it's a, a delightful piece uh, uh, eventually. But it is nerve wracking and um, it's supposed to be my hobby uh, and I'd like to think about it as my hobby, um, which I take 
I mean, I want to excel in my hobby, but yeah, it, it, um, you know, I'm definitely going to make music till the day I die, and I'm gonna. But now the wheel has turned, mm -hmm. and I'm also now painting. So where I left off in matric, or in uh, when I was 18, now I'm I'm here again, and you know, it just feels like a, a new. Uh, a new a new phase of my life is busy unfolding right in front of nice. me yeah that's so that's cool awesome. I, I must say I'm, I'm super jealous like two things i definitely can't do is uh play and make music and 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 you know create art and and i love them both uh, i guess um it's also through just you know my childhood and and never doing it so uh it's some it's something that's really beautiful and a nice way to to express yourself but look at your dad gareth he, oh, cool, he, you know, he started he learned piano pretty late, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it was it was like uh, Arno said. He he actually did it when he was really young, and then stopped and then started ah, again. So, ah, okay. um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, but but you actually mentioned uh, your wife now, Melanie, and she's she's your manager as well. She's the driving force behind tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does how does that dynamic work for you? You know, I mean, guess lots of people don't necessarily mix the two, family and business and these things, but often it does work for a lot of people too. So, how does it um, I think it's uh, the cardinal rule is never to mix uh, marriage and business, but um, <laughs> She's brilliant at what she does. At ma she's very good at managing me. I don't think she likes it. She's really, <laughs> really, really good at her job. Um, <laughs> You've got to say nice things now. She's going to listen to this one. <laughs> um, she's really good at her job. And she's a, you know, I think she's the best in the country. And, <laughs> and she's the best mom. Um, and uh, she makes the best food. <laughs> like, Look, the thing is, you got to be a tough cookie to do it, and uh, she doesn't take shit, and that's why she's so good at it. And uh, you know, I must just say, I think women should rule the world. I, I think men are pretty, yeah. pretty useless. Not everybody, but yeah. I, I, I'm projecting. Um, I'm just no, no <laughs> good. I'm no good at life, and without my wife, I don't think my career would have lasted this long. So. Um, it's uh, it's super interesting. She's, def she's definitely, she's definitely. Uh, um, if there's an award one day, it must go to her for sticking it out. Nice. Um, That's cool, man. That's cool. And it's it's really interesting what you said there about a woman ruling the world. I was listening to this podcast yesterday. It was about this guy. He's an Australian guy. He actually, he runs like anti poaching units in Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, and and all around Africa now. And uh, he set up the first uh, woman-only anti-poaching yeah. unit. And uh, he said their success rate has like killed any other anti-poaching units um, out there. The guys are lazy. Yeah, but also, yeah, but, yeah. They, but she, he says these, these, these ladies are armed and everything as well. He yeah. said they have not had to shoot one poacher yet, but have had the highest success rate. And it was like, Brilliant. wow, so many. Brilliant such a great yes story. that's cool yeah yeah, yeah, yeah really yeah. cool there's a lot of stories like that uh, coming out of the woodwork yeah. i had a story this weekend where uh, this woman um she's a single mom and lives somewhere in athlone or whatever and she went to these people and she said why can't they start a school where they train women to be plumbers and stuff because whenever something's wrong in a house, the guys come in and they make moves on a daughter and they make moves on her. Yeah. You know, the pig yeah. and the man are coming out. Yeah. And it totally makes sense. And imagine yeah. that you'd rather have a plumber, a female plumber and a female electrician come to your house for those sing moms. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's such a brilliant idea. Definitely. And so once again, I think they'll be fabulous plumbers. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because actually my, my wife is in the construction industry here in Australia. Wow, there and, you go. That, and that's exactly what you're saying. Like, you know, she's meticulous. She's kind. Uh, she's, she's not me? saying the C word every two seconds. And you can, you know, you can actually get a job done with a smile on your face. Uh, you know, and it just makes such a difference. And that's why she's actually busy because other people are like so sick and tired of people just not rocking up for work and being lazy, exactly what you said. So I think there's 
a revolution coming. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm sure you guys check it in the, in the UK. Um, I mean, I had this experience. We had a party on a boat. This guy got so drunk and they phoned the cops to come get him. And he was this bodybuilder. And they first they sent in the guys and he was like, rah, 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 rah. and then, then they sent mm. in the girl and he just went, and she just went, come here. And he's went, oh, okay. here we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, classic. Hulk um, is tired now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. True. Yeah. Um, ladies, oh, no, that's... Diffuse. ladies diffuse the moment. Totally. Yeah. But totally. <laughs> There's a, uh, yeah, there's a, my, I won't even say actually what my uncle used to say. It's quite funny, but it's probably not appropriate. <laughs> so Arno, so what are you, what are your plans going forward for the nudies and for your solo career and your arts? Um, tell mm. us a little bit about where you're heading um, down into the future. Okay. The new girls, I never say never, but <laughs> the, last year we talked about bringing out a new album. We actually recorded the album. Wow. We, we put out two songs, Beautiful Evolution and Best Friends, Best Enemies, uh, which you can listen to on uh, Apple Music or wherever. Um, and then there was just a pre-run with a couple of shows for the album, the big album that, that we recorded and that didn't finish mixing because we, we all had a big fight and now we don't know if we're ever going to play again. And um, I would actually like to leave it there. Um, I don't know if we'll ever play again, but what we're definitely going to do is there's an album. And I think nice. slowly but surely, I'm, I'm talking to Theo, we're going to mix it and we're going to put that out. I don't know when, I don't know where, but it's nice to know there's an album, mm, a nice. ghost album, you know what I mean? Sweet, yeah. yeah. So that's a cool thing to have. And so that, that will come out eventually sometime this year. And then mm -hmm. I, I, I uh, I haven't, because this was supposed to come out last year, the Nuclear's album, I, I didn't, I didn't actively, I didn't bring out anything. So I haven't brought out an album for almost three years. So now I'm busy with two projects. One is English and the one is Afrikaans. At the moment, on t tomorrow we'll be finishing off the first single, the mix of the first single for my English stuff. Nice. And that will go out probably in a month's time or a couple of weeks. And then um, um, <clears throat> basically recording a song every, every month while I'm writing the rest of the album. Um, and then I'm also, uh, tomorrow I'll also go in and do my first two demos or five demos for the Afrikaans album. Wow. So this is going to be a year of putting out lots and lots of music. I think... You know, um, uh, yes, Spotify and all those things, I believe, do steal artists' m money. Um, mm. But what it's also have done uh, and sort of killed the, the music industry in a, in a big way. But what it's also done is it's kind of liberated us from the sense of radio format and also liberated us from, from the thing of albums. I think we've returned yeah. now to the 60s where, you, where, where, where there were singles, you know. Mm, people right. were singles. So now um, you're either going to embrace it or you're going to fall behind and I'm embracing it. So what I'm going to do is just nice. put out as much music as possible all the time and no more of this waiting for, oh, we've got to do an album and there's a whole yeah. thing of how to do it with the media and create hype. And you know what? Yeah. After I've been in the industry for 25 years, no amount of hype I build is really going to make a song. You're either going to like it or not. Yeah. So, um, so from, from now on, off, I think into the future, I just want to put out songs every two months, a new track. And you know what? Uh, yeah, and just enjoy it and just do what I, what I, what I, what I want to do and what I need to do. And that is make music and be free with it and put it out. And, and, um, don't, there's no such thing as a shit idea. Just do it, do it all. And nice. then, um, while I'm at it, uh, while I'm at it, if I get sick of, you know, cause you write for three hours, get sick of it, take a break, paint. I mean, at the moment I've got enough work to do an exhibition, but, um, I will probably do an art exhibition 
later this year sometimes, but sometime, but um, at home. Let's see. <laughs> no, we what we're doing now is we're doing this. People can come to our house and we make them food and we, I give them wine. <laughs> and you look Lots. around and you check the Lots. picture and you and you check the paintings. And That's awesome. um, you know, we talk about yeah. it and we'll stuff like that. So that is something that, so cool. uh, that that you can do. And you can you can buy it right through here from directly from us instead of going to an art, art gallery. Great. That's really yeah. I think it'll be a, I think it'll almost be a bit more interesting. Totally, yeah, but because sure. then you can, like you said, the for you the backstory is interesting. Story, yeah. When you can tell yeah. the the person that wants to buy it the backstory to it, they go, oh, flip! I, I definitely want this picture now. Plus, yeah. I'll make you snacks, but it will be kind of gross, so you don't eat it. Then you feel, then you obliged. feel obliged, obliged <laughs> to drink some wine. <laughs> then I get you drunk. <laughs> nice. then, Bad. You feel ab- obliged to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> smart, and, and very smart, house. bud. Very smart. See, my <laughs> wife is the genius. <laughs> and and so, cool. j- just before we finish off, uh, I know we kind of touched on it before we actually started, but I'd love to know how you uh, create the lyrics, but then put the music with the lyrics. Like, how do you come up with that music? And and how do you always think of new tunes and I, to me, it's just like, wow, there's so much that's been produced in this world, you know, since day X. Like, how do you just come up with new stuff? I think, um, I think we don't know it, but I think all artists are busy re- constantly regurgitating something they su- that's stuck in their subconscious that they've heard r- when, you know, years ago. Mm. Um, musically, it's almost impossible because music is is math is is math is maths it's mm. mathematical but the fact is there's different um of course there's different um equations uh, an infinite amount of different uh, equations to a format but um we are, it feels like at the moment we are regurgitating stuff and uh, and now it's more of like throwing just little bits of different stuff together and to make something new that's interesting, but mm. it will probably reflect something out of the eighties or out of the nineties. <laughs> out of the, um, so we're in a potpourri almost of, uh, of music in, in the moment, but interesting, you know, we you won't know it, but I believe that we are basically in the punk revival at the moment, mm. although you won't hear it in the music, you know, in the in the band and the musically, but what we will hear it in is uh, the angry type or or opposite of angry, but with interesting angles of social commentary going on about mm. what's happening in the world. I mean, two of the bands that I really like is, the Sh- is Shame from the UK, mm. um, Shame and the um, the Idols. You okay, know what yeah. I mean? You, yeah. There's definitely a, 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 a Sleaford mods, mods, um, and um, there's a lot of um, punk actually. I mean, what is the girl who, who sings that? Um, Lana Del Rey. You oh know yes. She's yeah. Punk. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to do punk music to be punk. Yeah. But there's definitely yeah. a punk revival in the air, and, and there's a lot of poetry and. Um, uh, anti this and anti this and mm. they're doing it just in different ways but um so what was the question <laughs> no i was just wondering like how you came up with uh ah, music oh yeah, yourself stuff. to match the lyrics yeah but you guess you yeah. answered um, and also you know when, when you're busy writing a song you, you don't analyze oh what's coming first you it's more of like uh, oh my god let's make this work and then you know i don't go I don't break down what idea comes first or what I think is. I've got other things to think about, but mm. I've had this experience where I wrote um, lyrics and I, I, I wrote I wrote with Mike Rutherford from Genesis mm. for his one album. I wrote uh, I wrote some songs with him, and there I would walk into the studio and he'll play me this piece of music that he wrote, and then I would listen to it and I would go oh get the vibe of 
waves on the open ocean traveling the seas and longing wow. so these words pop up what the mm. music conveys through the minor chords and the melody and and, and and then with his melody then my counter melody and my head starts working mm. with that in mind and that is when the songs uh, start taking uh, it starts taking on a, a, an identity and a way forward and then eventually the song is born um, ah, classic and a That's crazy, man. Oh, cool. interesting man yeah. well just uh, just before we end off here oh no we have one last question and we like to ask all of our guests this question and it is uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you <laughs> <laughs> what does ridiculously human mean to you? Jesus, go away, go away, go away, go away. What does ridiculously human mean to you? Oh. Um, do you know what I find to be ridiculously human? It's the fact that when you, you're young and you go into your teenage years, you rebel because you think you're unique. And then eventually you grow up and you realize you weren't unique. <laughs> and then, but then you still keep doing these things that is just so predictable, <laughs> predictably <laughs> human yeah. with the thought that you are unique, but <laughs> you are just ridiculously human. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's love. I love that, bud. <laughs> well, that, man, that's really cool, bud. That's really, yeah. really cool, bud. That was really um, deep. So, uh, do, do you just quickly want to tell us like the best way for people to get in touch with you, to follow you? We put a whole lot of show notes together and with all your contact details. Um, so it all go yeah. in there. Um, look, I don't know when, the, when this podcast is going out and everything, but just by the way, I just want to sound excited. Next week, we're opening up for Brian Ferry, which is going to be awesome. Wow. Great. That's cool. So, okay. But then besides that, um, you can so where, where is that? And, and, and tell us more about that. Uh, well, it's here in South Africa. I think we're doing two shows at, you know, uh, it's, it's normally like, in South Africa, the people play at casinos. <laughs> yeah. So, you must just check out where. Check, yeah. Me. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we'll check it out. And then, uh, okay, if you want to get hold of me, and if you want to check out what I, uh, you know, um, stuff I like and stuff I like and stuff like that, I, 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 I retweet if I like something, if I think it could be interesting. So I'm, I'm on, I'm on Twitter as Honor Carstens. Great. Uh, cool. Uh, I think uh, yeah, and then um, also at Honor Carstens on, on Instagram. And at Anna Carson's Fine Art. On right. a, it's also another Instagram thing. We're just the paintings on. Cool. Uh, Anna Carson's Fine Art. And then I'm on Facebook. Well, just Facebook. We'll, we, we'll, we'll find it all, yeah. We'll find it all, yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. That comes. Epic. Um, all right. But I just wanted to say thank you on my behalf uh, for coming on our podcast. I know okay. that. I know that. First of all, Craig was like flipping so excited. He's like, yes, yes I can't believe we chatting to Honor Carstens because he's, <laughs> he's massively into South African music. And I mean, so oh, am I. Cool. But, and Great, so he, you know, he's been like just yeah. super excited <laughs> and, and it's, it's just amazing speaking to you. But just on my behalf, like you had such a sort of big influence in, in my childhood, like growing up, listening to the radio and stuff and going to music gigs and so for us to speak to you is just an absolute honor and just to hear that sort of layer down of like who you actually are and what you went through is, is super special for us you know it's like you know we just long for these sort of conversations and, and we dream of having like conversations with guys like you that have had such a big influence in our lives and, and it's nice you know what's so lacquer is just like you're such a normal guy you and happy you 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 like us you you like to have a good time. oh you are oh, unique let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, <laughs> you know, that, that, there's no doubt about that but 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 it's just cool that you you're such a normal bloke do you know what i mean like and you you're just happy to cool, have a man. smile with us and a laugh with us and 
and we just really appreciate that element of, of you as a person. So thanks so much for coming on our show. It's been in such a great chat. Awesome, man. And then um, I mean, I was just, I, I've got a lot of other telephone numbers for you. If you Amazing. Want to some more interesting people. We would yes. love that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Just uh, text me and ask me how. Yeah, no, thanks, Anna. We will. Thank wow, you. And amazing, just, cool look, I'm, I'm going to keep it real brief just from my side. I, I can't uh, really improve on what Gareth said. They're really epic chats. You're a great guy. You have a lot of depth to what you, you say and, and do and, uh, and, and very diverse. And it's a, a really inspiring thing of like how you've reinvented yourself through different times and different challenges and different places. And that's also super inspiring. So we just uh, want to really like emulate in our own lives some of the stuff you're doing and, and uh, we'll just definitely keep rocking on to some of those epic uh, tunes that, are, that fueled our youth as well. So uh, it's just we're very grateful for this time. So um, thanks again from, our, from my side as well. Awesome, man. And then, yeah, I think I'll be in the UK in June. Oh, so awesome, man. Yeah, but yeah. I'll totally Epic. be there. It'll be great to yeah, see. Yeah, man. yeah. Awesome. So man. just follow Epic. the thing and then you'll see when we... I normally come around June, we do a bit of Isle of Wight and then half moon Putney and all the... Sweet. Yeah. Small, small little nice theatres. So we'll... Yeah. Great I'll bring the guys there. and we're going to do some shows. So we'll yeah. hopefully see you there. And then also Australia. Yeah. I've got to get to Australia, man. Come on, um, man. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll ask you over there. I'll you know speak to you. I know, and let's hook you up. Jesus. <laughs> yes. Great, you know man. what? I can come on my own. I can bring Art Matthews with. I can bring Zulani. We can. Okay. All right, guys. All right, buddy. Thanks again. Thank you so much, hey, bud. Lovely meeting you. Yeah, you too, man. Take See care, you, you too, bud. Take care, man. See you soon. Cheers, Cheers bud. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> bye bye. How do we put it on? Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging for change.